the stewards here. Would you raise your hand? <laughs> Anybody guess who he is? He's from Poplar Bluff, and he's like Santa. He's the best Santa I've ever seen. So kids, line up in the foyer after church, and, and he's going to hear whatever you want. It's always a refreshing thing to see. I just, the white just stood out, and I just kind of found myself frozen. Anybody sitting here thinking all the, all the morning, like, 1 o'clock would be a really nice time to do this again? Anybody, anybody else think about that? We could, uh, several of you, I think we need to sign a petition and really give some consideration this 1 o'clock permanent time thing. That would be really, really cool. Y yes, yes, I think so. I also thought one other thing. What, what did the Malones do over here? Did y'all pinch Jacob or something? I mean, he just went, just all of a sudden, this sweet kid, I'm thinking, that's a mom's fault. I, I just had 1-800 number going on my phone. I thought, no, nah, I'll give them a chance to explain themselves. But uh, we are in Matthew 10, you'll see, but we're going to start in Genesis 3, where we were uh, with the reading, just after we sing together. Jesus. It's time for the So we're back almost to the beginning of time, even though we're going to end up at the beginning of the New Testament. But you've got this scene where, G, where Adam names all the creatures. You remember this, that, that all these creatures come by and Adam gives them all a name. And he sees that there's nothing quite like him in all of creation. And then God takes a rib and makes a woman for him, walks her down the aisle, presents, him to, presents her to him, and he likes what he sees, and they get married, and it says, and they were naked together, and there was no shame. There was perfect innocence, and it was a, a naive kind of state, but it was a perfect state of being. But it all comes crashing down in Genesis chapter 3 when a third personality enters the garden. It's a serpent. And it says in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent was more crafty than any other creature God had made. I, I, I find this a little strange, how God made one particular creature more crafty than another. And this converse, there's a conversation that starts between the woman and the serpent. Did anybody ever go... Anybody read that story and go, why, why is she carrying on a conversation with a snake? You ever wonder that? Does this not shock anybody? There's another story in Scripture, you know, where a guy carries on a conversation with his donkey and never stops to wonder, what's odd about this? I have been in conversations with people I thought were like donkeys and felt, you know, but I've never, to, to carry on a conversation with an animal like this. And the only way I can understand this, and I may be wrong, but I just don't know, there's not enough information here. I think already Satan's involved with this serpent. Satan's already taken over this creature and allows it and empowers it to talk and have a conversation. But the interesting thing is the word crafty. Or shrewd is really what this word is. It's very wise. And what it means is you have an end that you're wanting a person to get to and you have the persuasiveness to move them toward that. A clear idea of where you want someone to go and you're, you're sharp enough to persuade them to go in that direction and get to that end. And that's what the serpent does. And, and, and then as if to give you an illustration, it shows the serpent, the crafty, shrewd serpent in action. And the first thing the, the serpent does is he asks a question. Um, what did God command about this? What did God say about this tree? Points out the tree, right? Did God really say don't eat from this tree? Now the way he says it creates a little bit of doubt and makes her wonder, did he really say that? And, and she says, well, God did say don't eat it and don't even touch it. God never said anything about not touching it. She's added to this a little bit. 
But she repeats what God says, but he, he, he starts a question. The first thing he does is ask a question, God really say that? Is that really something that, that God said to you? And I don't know if God ever said it to Eve or not. I'm assuming he did, but we know he said it to Adam in chapter 2. Have you ever noticed what bad decisions people make? And they say, well... I'm going to re-study what Scripture says about that. And things that have been taught for years and years about this, suddenly we want to study it over again as if we might discover something new. Or, or somebody might say, you know, I'd, I'm just not really sure the Bible is all that clear on that, when very uh, actually it is. But people will try to, it's almost like Satan tries to put something, a seed of doubt, just by asking the question, what did God actually say? And then she says it, and he says, well, no, no, let's, 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 let's rephrase. God didn't really mean that. He reframes what God says. He's not really that serious. Did he say you'd actually die? You won't actually die. God is not going to punish you. You've been walking with him in the cool of the evening. You know what God's like. You know he's kind, he's compassionate, and he's loving. He would never be that cruel for one simple thing like this. And accenting the grace of God causes us to actually compromise on the truth of God. It's so easy to do this. Serpent's good. He reframes his, oh, you won't really die. And then, and then he gives her a new alternative motive. What God really did was he didn't want you to become like him. He knows that if you eat this, you'll become just like him. Never mind that Eve is already just like him, right? But once you eat the tree, you're going to be like God, knowing good and evil. And so he gives an alternative motive, and it's very effective. I want you to see this with the response of the woman. When the woman saw, and saw guides everything that's said after this, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, can you look at a tree and see that it's good for fruit, food? And the answer is yes, you can. By the way, this wasn't an apple. I am convinced the only fruit we know for sure was in the garden was figs. How do you know this? Fig leaves that became their clothing. I believe this was a fig tree she was looking at. And when she saw it was good for food, can you see that a tree is good for food? Yes, you can. Can you see that it's satisfying? That's the other one. That it's a delight to the eyes. Oh, that looks delightful. That makes my mouth water, right? Can you see that by looking at a tree? Yeah, you can. And when she saw that it was desired to make one wise, she took it and she, can you look at a tree and its fruit and know that it's going to make you wise? No. But he painted such a good picture for her that she could actually see a lie. See something that wasn't true. She could actually see it, and based on what she could actually see, she did it. It's sort of like, you ever eat with Bill Berry? It's interesting, he tells you all sorts of things, but he said, you need to eat those carrots, and I said, well, I mean, carrots are good. He says, um, you know it helps your eyes. Have you ever heard that? Carrots help your eyes? I ate carrots all my life. And I've had Lasix, and now I'm needing reading glasses. I'm telling you, carrots have nothing to do with your eyes. But Bill says they help you with car carrots, help you with your eyes, because have you ever seen a rabbit with glasses? <laughs> That's the stupidest reason I've ever heard in my life, right? But Bill's 93. Who's going to argue with him, right? Or have you ever been told this, eat your green beans and to put hair on your chest? How many were told that too? I don't know if that's really what did it or not. I don't have a clue. We say all sorts of weird things about what food can do. And here Satan says, this food, if you eat it, will make you wise like God. And no, it won't. It's not true, but you know what? She believed it and he painted it so realistically that she could see that this fig was going to make her wise. And she ate it. This is what it means right here when it says that the serpent was crafty or shrewd. And I'm going to tell you two reasons why you need to know this story. One of them has nothing to do with this sermon at all, so it doesn't really count. It's like I, I'm just going to throw in a couple minutes for free here, right? 
These are all of Satan's weapons right here in one spot. These six verses contain everything Satan's going to do to try to trip you up. This is all he does right here. These three things. That's it. He does this with Jesus in the wilderness. It doesn't work. He does this in other places. This is his M.O. This is what he does. He's done nothing new since creation. They're old and they're worn out, but they are effective and they're real and they work with everybody. Satan does this with all of us. And every time we say, man, I've been fooled. He got me again. And then the next day we do it again, hoping maybe this time it'll be true. It's crazy how he tricks us. He is the tempter. He's the deceiver. Now notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Satan brings this up again, only it's in the context of the church at Corinth, and he says, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, his shrewdness, your thoughts will be led astray from sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone goes and, or comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from, anyone you, from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. You heard the truth, you responded to it, and yet somebody comes in with false, not true information, another alternative gospel, and you're just saying, yeah, I see that too, I see that too. It's like you have no, absolute no training in being able to know what the true gospel is compared to all the others. And all it does, really, he says, is it distracts your thoughts, leads them astray from devotion to Christ. The serpent is still slithering his way across human history every day in churches and in lives, putting seeds in the lives of people that makes them look at sin differently, look at truth differently, look at God differently. He's still around. The same tactic that Satan used to kick them out of paradise is used to hurt the church in Corinth and is still alive and well in our lives. And what should they have done? Just listen to God. Just trust His Word is true. Now that's, we could, we could do a whole sermon on that stuff, we're not, but one of the reasons you need to know Genesis chapter 3, 1 through 6 is to know how Satan's going to work in your life and how he has been working and will continue to work in your life. He's not going to change anything, that's exactly how he's going to do it. But that's not the reason in this sermon we're looking at this. I'm looking at this, we are looking at this because this is how you should do with the world. We should be just like Satan. We should copy this. This works. And we should use his tactics against him. Now that sounds odd, doesn't it? But that's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, which is where we are now. Move forward to Matthew chapter 10. There's all sorts of metaphors that Jesus uses to describe our behavior in the world. One of them is... You're to be salt and light, not like salt or don't be salt. You are salt. You are light. And you think, I think we all know what that means. Salt is a preservative. And as we live our Christian lives, we preserve the world. Light shines light into darkness and reveals the truth. He calls us sheep and he says he's the shepherd. I think we all know that even though we're not in a shepherding culture. But there is one image he uses that is just very odd. And I don't really like it and neither do most people. He says, you're to be like a serpent. I want you to be crafty like a serpent. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Now, how many of you like snakes? There are always a weird one or two. I, I already know that what I'm about to say is going to be on Facebook. How dare he say something against God's creatures? I hear it. But you put it on there, I do not care what you think. The truth is, serpents are evil, wicked, and the only good one is a dead one. <laughs> and you can sit there and say, but they're God's creatures. Yes, but you see, I've got verses that say, man is to crush his head. And so you come up with a, you come up with a law or a guy with a gun saying, hey, you know it's illegal to kill that snake. Did you know it's biblical for me to do so? And for you to tell me not to is asking me to violate my religion. Let's go to court, big boy. That's what I want to say, right? <laughs> Because we've got this, this, this screwed up humanity. All of us are messed up because of the stupid snake. We should kill them all. Right. 
I'm doing therapy. Well, <laughs> there is a fear of snakes, and I hate them. I'm like Indiana Jones. I just as soon not have them around. And they messed up everything. And yet, in all this, he chooses this image. I want you to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Matthew 10 is hard to translate or apply. Matthew 10 is instructions given to the apostles for this mission they're about to go on. And there's not much of it that applies to us. We love it for its history. We appreciate it for what it describes about how the apostles became who they were. But it really doesn't have any relevance to us at all except how we're supposed to live our lives in a world that doesn't appreciate our faith. He says, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Now, if you're a wolf and you go to a restaurant and you're given a menu, what's going to be on the menu? Sheep. And God says, into a world like that, I'm sending you as sheep. So he's going to tell you, I'm going to tell you this. He says, as you're living a Christian life in the world that we live in is a dangerous proposition. It really is because the world doesn't appreciate you that much. And so you become prey for the wicked of the world. Now, sometimes, he says, you live the Christian life and everybody just kind of disregards you. They don't care. It's, it's just one thing among many. And they're fine. There's no harm. But there are some people who hate Christians can't stand them, have no use for them, and they will mistreat them. And there will be some that have split up families because of it. They can't stand you that bad. So what he says is, I want you to know you're going out into a world that may not appreciate your Christian faith, but I'm sending you anyway. Your job is the same. And here's how you conduct yourself. Here's how I want you to live. And guys, this is our word from Matthew chapter 10. It's the only thing really that gives us relevance. So much of the message is about not fearing and not being anxious because what he knows is living a Christian life in a fallen world does have some fear and anxiety in it. And I, he, he wants to give us some help with this. Be wise as serpents. What in the world? I know salt and I know light and I know sheep and I know that stuff but what does it mean when he says I want you to be wise as serpents the only image that that could possibly refer to is Genesis chapter 3 where the very same word wise is translated crafty same Greek word same one and so he said, I want to take you back to that story, and I want you to look at Satan. I want you to look at Lucifer's tactics, and I want you to learn from them. And I want you to be like that in the world. The only difference is he, he combines it with the word innocent as doves. Now, you remember crafty means this, knowing where you want people to go and being able to persuade them to go there. That's what crafty means, drawing them a picture of where you want them to go and where they need to go, and then you being able to persuade them to go there. That's what crafty means. And he says, that's how I want you to be like the serpent in Genesis chapter 3. I want you to care about getting them where they need to go. This is not manipulation. This is not trying to trick them. Not like Satan did. His purposes were malevolent. His purposes were to kick them out of paradise. Our purposes is to help them find paradise. That's what our task is. And he paints this picture. You know what? We want the world to end up with God in eternity. Is that what we want? We want everybody to end up there. We don't want anybody to face the punishment of being away from God. And we, don't, we want people to have the peace that he talks about in Matthew 10 as well. That's what we want, and we want to persuade people to live the kind of life that will produce that result. And we need to be shrewd. We need to be crafty in a positive sense. What are we supposed to get from this, though? I think you would agree if you're shrewd, the house is on fire and the people living in it don't know it and you come into their house unannounced and you say, listen, your house is on fire, you need to get out of here. And even if they don't believe you, you need to persuade them because this is dangerous, this is life-threatening, a matter of life and death. Everybody would agree you have a right to do that. Do we have a right to do that with them spiritually? Do we know the danger that's ahead for them? Yes, we do. And do we want to persuade them? Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, since we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade men. Not manipulation, not false motives. We want to persuade them. Be wise as serpents. So if we are wise like Satan in Genesis 3, how can we put that to good use 
I want to say this. I want to reverse everything Satan did. I'm just going to put it this way. First of all, we need to question the world just like Satan questioned Eve. We need to make them answer us. We need to make them tell us why is it that you think your way of life is the best. Here's the way I see the world doing it. They attack us all the time because what we believe is written in Scripture. It's black and white. It's objective. It's accessible to anybody. Anybody can go to Walmart and buy a Bible and look at the words of God and what we believe. We don't keep it hidden. We don't keep it secret. We don't have some special society where we keep the special words from God from anybody else. We publish them. We make them in the most published book in the history of the world and we say to people this is God's truth and we don't apologize for it and we don't send out renewals every year to update it to keep up with the times it's this this is the clear words of God and if you'll do them you'll live is that what we believe And the thing is that it can be abused so badly, people take pot shots at it, people laugh at it and belittle it, people mock it all the time, and people undermine it all the time, and yet here we are years later still with the same book saying the same things. It's not change, it's the words from God, and you can access them anytime you want to, and we can't, we can't change them without everybody in the world knowing it. But what does the world do? It has an alternative doctrine, but they never publish it. They have an alternative way of living, but they never really say it because they want to keep it open. They want to keep it subtle, and they want to be able to change it with every generation that they want. But I'm going to tell you, Satan watches Adam and Eve for a long time and then picks his time, and he comes up to them, and he starts putting them on the defensive. I'm tired of the church being on the defensive. Let's go on the offensive. Let's go attack them. What's your truth? Well, the truth is happiness is the greatest value in the world. Is that true? I know the world thinks so, but I want them to say it. Yes, happiness is the highest value, in the, and the, va the, the, the way you judge the value of a person is how much he's actually monetarily worth. Is that really true? And the best freedom is the kind of freedom where you're not restrained by anything. You do whatever in the world you want to. And the world lauds that and proclaims that on every sitcom and in every movie. Real freedom is doing whatever you want to do and you don't care about anybody else. That's their doctrine. And if you can get them to say it, let them say it. And move to step number two. How's that working for you? How's this working for the world? The most prosperous nation on the planet, the most free nation on the planet is also the most therapeutically weak. We have more people going to counselors and having to do psychotherapy than any, any generation on the face of the planet. How is it that you finally get everything that you want and you're so screwed up? Start attacking some. And saying to them, this is what you believe, but I'm telling you, I, I, I'm looking at this and I'm, I, I'm put the worldliness of the world on scrutiny. And I'm going to tell you this, they don't have much to argue with. They can't really support themselves very well. And then you come to number three, offer an alternative way of living. That's what's called in Matthew 10, the kingdom of God. I want you to go preach the kingdom of God. When God is reigning over your life and you give him the control, you give them the sovereignty, you give him the say, he's on the throne and you simply live out what he tells you to, that's called kingdom. And kingdom is the best kind of life you can live. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I've got to be honest with you. Sometimes it may it means you got to deny yourself. Sometimes the things you want to do, you can't do if you're in the kingdom of God. Can I tell you if you live, and I told the college students this this morning, if last week there was nothing that you did growling under your breath not wanting to, but you did it because you're a Christian, if there wasn't some moments like that, you are not living the kingdom of God. And if there aren't some things you didn't make yourself do that you didn't want to do, then you're not living the kingdom of God because that's just what, it's what is called living in the sovereignty of God. He tells me something and I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's called kingdom living. And I'm going to tell you this, sometimes you've got to do what you don't want to do. Sometimes you can't do what inside you you want to do, all because you're restrained by the word of God and it's the best way to live in peace. The world can't quite grasp that, and I get it. 
I sometimes argue too. But I'm going to tell you, I think what would have happened in the garden uh, if, if things would have been handled right, as soon as Satan comes and says, what did God say? And she says, this is what God says. This is what we're doing. Go away. And we need to live the same way. Because if we want paradise too, God's given us clear instructions. And guys, I'm going to tell you, there's so many of these they go against the grain of what we want and what we're trained as Americans and to demand our rights. There's so much of this that goes against the grain. But I'm going to say it, and I believe it's true. We need to live by the Word of God, most especially when we don't want to. Most especially when we don't want to. And it's the best way to live. It presents you with mighty temptations in our world. And so many times, i got to tell you, when I'm trying to share, if I ever try to share this with somebody, I'm almost apologetic. I'm almost like, I don't really want to because I know that I'm going to spoil your fun. And I know you're not going to like this. And I'm tentative. And I'm a little bashful. And I'm a little timid. Which Paul tells Timothy, quit being that way. He gave you a spirit of love and power and self-discipline. And I feel like sometimes what I'm trying to do is talk somebody into eating their greens and their hominy and their asparagus because they ought to when I know deep down they're not gonna any more than I would. But the gospel's not like that. Not really. It's God giving us inside information from our Creator on how best to live our lives. And sometimes everything within us wants to prove God wrong. And we want to say, just like Satan did with Eve, no, he's not trying to protect you. He's keeping fun from you. And we buy the lie. And we see it so clearly. We go with it. And then we're fooled. And we think, man, he was right. But too late then. We need to be like Satan. We need to be on the offensive. We need to question the world. Why do you think God's wrong? Why are you saying these things against God? Because I'm going to tell you, when you do it God's way and you're one man and one woman for life, you avoid a lot of the messes that people get themselves into, don't you? You avoid a lot of those messes. Well, isn't that dull? Isn't that monotony? I mean, monogamy? You might feel like it sometimes, but when you carry this to the end of your life, you'll look at the wisdom of it and you'll thank God for it. And you have those moments when you want to be like the world and say, you know what, I'm not attracted to him anymore. I want to ditch him and get another one. And everything within you says that just makes total sense. And I think that would really lead to happiness. And, but, but something tells you that's not what God said. Yeah, but, but I'm telling you, it makes all the sense to all these social psychologists and all these books that I read. My, I know, I know, I know. All of them against this. And this is the only reason. Psychologists will also tell you, if they're honest with you, that a lot of times if you'll just wait a little while through the difficult stuff, the good stuff will return. But you've got to be a little bit patient. And you've got to trust his words when they don't make sense to your heart. Do it anyway. Question the world's doctrine. Help them see where it's not helping them much either. And cast an alternative vision. Kingdom of God for people. And don't apologize for it. It's written right here. And I'm promising you, if we will start preaching and stay preaching to the message that God said, we will never in any generation be embarrassed about standing up for what he says. I will never feel like I'm going to be proven wrong by the next scientific journal somewhere. If we will just stand on what God says and really share with people, this is where life is, we will be doing the work of the church your job this week is going to feel like you're a sheep among wolves the world won't agree with you they won't endorse your lifestyle they won't understand your way of living they'll think it's prudish and they may think it's old fashioned but your task is to go out into that world and be as shrewd as snakes 
innocent as doves. Be like Satan in your craftiness, but be innocent because you're right. So be shrewd, but also be right. And never be shrewd at the cost of being right and pure. Be both at the same time. Your task is to go out into Jonesboro, wherever you live, this week, and be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. And let's share with the world and be a little bit on the offensive. I think if Eve would have done that, we'd be living in a perfect world. And I think if we'd start doing it now, we'll make the world a little more perfect for a few more people who are willing to listen. But live that way. Go out and be snakes, church. If there's anyone who needs to respond this morning, make it known as we stand and as we sing. Turn my heart.